Hello and welcome to another episode of How to Be a Great GM. We're looking at settings and, you might have guessed it, we're looking at dinosaurs. Now, the dinosaur setting is an unusual space. And the reason why I say it's unusual is because it is a space that holds a huge amount of mystery, a huge amount of awesome creatures, and yet is fairly unexplored in terms of role-playing systems and also in terms of feature films. Now, there are a couple films that have made dinosaurs fairly famous, but considering that almost every young man who grows up as a seven-year-old at some point thinks dinosaurs are cool, we have quite a small amount of material based on it. So when we come to looking at what do we expect from the role-playing space or from the setting of dinosaur, what do we expect? Well, we expect dinosaurs. What particularly about dinosaurs do we expect? Well, we expect meat-eating dinosaurs and herbivorous dinosaurs and possibly omnivorous dinosaurs. The herbivorous dinosaurs are all seen as being these docile, friendly creatures that blow snot all over people when they encounter them high up in trees. The carnivorous creatures are all slightly intelligent, predatory type of things that roam around in packs or as an individual, but can always outsmart the homo sapien brain whenever they encounter them. Uh, just up until the point that the homo sapien outsmarts them, of course. And then you get the omnivorous ones, which are the little ones that run around and do all sorts of crazy little things, but generally are more of a nuisance only when they're in mass numbers rather than when they're on their own. Now we're going to look at that expectation a little bit later on and we're going to look at how we need to turn that on its head and how nature itself actually prescribes something fairly opposite in terms of animal behavior. So we expect dinosaurs, we expect scale, we expect small little dinosaurs that can fit in the palm of your hand and will one day turn into chickens and we expect titanic dinosaurs, literally titanosaurus or argentinosaurus for that matter. Massive, massive, 25, 30 meter long creatures weighing 90 tons and roaming around gigantic coniferous forests. Now, the uh, scale reference is also to the, flora, uh, the, the, the fauna uh, and the flora in particular. The plants are all huge. There is nothing small about it. Interestingly enough, in science fiction, plants take on a slightly different characteristic too. Uh, we get gigantic carnivorous plants that entrap small passerbys or humans, where in actual fact plants during the dinosaur period or periods were fairly underdeveloped given what they are today. Nonetheless, we expect scale. We also expect some kind of isolation from technology. So even if it is a lab coat dressed mad scientist who creates the dinosaurs and brings them to life, they're going to run around in these fairly um, natural environments. That's what makes them scarier. When we put dinosaurs into cities and into structures, we have to take a little bit of a leap of imagination and they become severely limited because structures usually aren't built to massive scale. So to see a brachiosaur wandering through a stadium, how did it get in there? How is it going to get out? It just opens up complications. But we expect that the technology that we have will be insufficient to defeat the creatures that we are facing. And if you look at giant monster movies, that is a complete theme that runs, oh, excuse me, that runs throughout most of the movies, is the technology is no longer valid. And there are some exceptions to that. We'll come back to that. What else do we expect? Well, we expect that the dinosaurs are not going to behave like regular creatures. They are going to be vindictive. They're going to be mean. They're going to follow the party wherever the party happens to be. And they will have a certain anthropomorphic ability to go with the villain of the story rather than just to be mindless creatures. And I apologize for the light changing. We are in storm season here. It's deepest, darkest summer. So clouds frequently block out the sun. Which is, by the way, the next thing that we expect in terms of dinosaurs. We expect cataclysmic world-ending natural disasters. 
whether it's volcanoes that are erupting, destroying everything, whether it is asteroids impacting into the planet, whether it is a valley that is now going to be flooded with water and wipe out all the dinosaurs, it doesn't matter. Perhaps the dinosaurs are trapped inside an old caldera of a volcano and that is why they've been isolated from the rest of the world, etc, etc, etc. So often the environment itself becomes part of the entire narrative that you're going to be telling in terms of your dinosaur setting, simply because it is part of the expectation of our players. We also expect, and this is for those of us that are a little bit more fanciful in terms of our interpretation of dinosaurs, is that we expect that um, the dinosaurs will cooperate to a certain degree. Once we've got mind control abilities and we can talk to the dinosaurs, the herbivores will cooperate with us immensely and the carnivores will, after we've assaged their fears, work with us. Uh, equally so. And once the evil uh, force mind controls their dinosaurs, those dinosaurs become aggressive, meat-eating, regardless of whether they were herbivorous before or not, and pose a significant threat. But the moment their mind control is broken, they immediately revert back to being docile types of creatures. So there's quite a bit to expect. There is also an interesting element about the dinosaur setting, which is one of the reasons why I personally think that it hasn't been used a lot in terms of environment. It is a fairly closed system. Yes, you could have perhaps uh, aliens being involved in the dinosaurs, and that's a very common kind of uh, linking aliens and dinosaurs together. But in terms of encounters, in terms of plot, in terms of story, uh, which is what we're moving into right now, what are the plots that are suggested by this kind of, of environment? The plots are fairly limited. Either the party is being chased by a giant man-eating dinosaur, or the party is hunting down a giant eating man uh, dinosaur, or the dinosaurs are being hunted down by other hunters and the party has to save them. The dinosaurs themselves are not intelligent enough to pose a significant threat other than the traditional chase or be chased kind of environment. So as a setting, the plot requirements, the expectation requirements, is that you are going to mix it up somehow. Now, one of the frequent ways that you can use the dinosaur's uh, setting is by having it as a bubble setting within a greater campaign. So perhaps you have scientists who run around inventing or resurrecting eggs and splicing DNA with frogs and all those kind of wonderful things. Or perhaps it's a spaceship that crash lands on this planet. Or perhaps it is a missing continent that no one knows about and has been named after a lemur. Uh, whatever the case might be, the dinosaur setting is going to be difficult if you are simply going to use it as that. Yes, there are exceptions. There are a few books that have been written about dinosaur civilizations, but often those bring in the Atlantean myth or they bring in the idea that humans somehow coexist. And then it's more about the politics of the humans that have dinosaurs as a base from which to work rather than the actual dinosaurs themselves as being the central focus of the story. So plot wise, it is a very thin space to play in and you're going to have to think really carefully in terms of how do you bring it into your game so that your game doesn't just devolve down into, oh look, it's a pack of Uteraptors, now we have to run away. Oh look, it's a pod of Hadrosaurs, they're going to make bellowing calls and they're not going to attack us. Oh, there's an Iguanodon that is now feeding at the water, isn't that lovely? You need to, to incorporate other settings into it. A zombie apocalypse with dinosaurs that have been released and they're zombie dinosaurs. That could be interesting. Again, though, unless there is some kind of conflict with the party with other intelligent beings, aliens or other humans or uh, intelligent dinosaurs that we have not known about, the grounds for plotting is fairly thin. Now, if we look at the tone that this entire space sets, the tone is very important. And the tone should be one of wonder and discovery. Yes, these are amazing creatures that are wandering around. This is a fossil tooth of a dinosaur, well, of a shark that was swimming around in the waters several hundred million years ago, depending on 
your interpretation of time. That is a massive tooth. It is the size, quite literally, of my thumb. That is something truly terrifying. Having sat next to our biggest predators that we have on the planet, in terms of a full-grown male lion, I can promise you his teeth may have been that big, if at all. So these are terrifying creatures in terms of scale. They're wondrous creatures as well. There is so much that we don't know about them. So you've got to bring that in. And even though you've got the terror, and that is part of the tone of being chased by this giant creature that can run at 40 miles an hour and that has a bite that's big enough to swallow an 11-year-old child, provided that it's a small child and they're covered in grease, they have that capacity. It is about inducing that sense of wonder and that sense of scale. So that's the tone. The tone is also of unknown, of a mystery. Why are they here? How are they here? How do they move? What feasts upon 20 meter long creatures whose tails break the sound barrier because they can flick them so hard and with so much momentum because they have so much weight behind them? This is a, a space for you to create a sense of wonder and immediately to shatter it with a sense of terror as a whole bunch of little one meter high velociraptors come running through with their toe-like claws ready to start decimating the party. If we get back now in terms of using our tone, we get back to the original expectation that dinosaurs and the herbivores in particular are all docile creatures. Having been around the African herbivorous animals, such as the elephant, the rhinoceros, the buffalo, even the little bush buck, I can absolutely assure you that just because they are herbivores, does not mean that they are cattle. There is a reason why we only have a small number of domesticated wildlife, such as cattle, chickens, sheep, and the like. It's because they have the fundamental quality of being docile. A rhinoceros, whether it is a black rhinoceros or a white rhinoceros, is in no way docile. Having climbed trees because of them chasing me, I can assure you they are aggressive, mean bastards. So the idea that the Triceratops is just going to allow humans to move between it because they are an unknown entity is absolute rubbish. They will attack, stamp, stomp, skewer, gore, horn, or otherwise disembowel anything that approaches them that they remotely see as something that is out of the ordinary. And animals see humans as out of the ordinary. Trust me, we're very strange as a species. So the idea that we have these mega creatures that are wandering around and that will just passively look at this diminutive little person is nonsense. They will be aggressive. Elephants have very little to fear from humans, generally speaking, but they will still decimate the car and the people inside of it just because they had a bad day. So turn that immediately on its head. Hollywood loves to make the herbivores look as if they're the good creatures. They're just as mean and nasty as the carnivores. And as a matter of fact, most carnivores are fairly inactive once they've fed. I've been around prides of lions where, yes, admittedly, once I got too close, they decided that they were going to try and eat me, and thankfully they didn't. But generally speaking, they lie out underneath the trees in the sun, waiting for their stomachs to grumble and to motivate them to go hunting. They are not bloodthirsty, vindictive creatures. They are simply trying to get by. So remember to play with those kind of things because that's what you really are testing here, is you're testing our interpretation of dinosaurs. Now, there are many, many rumors that dinosaurs got to the capacity where they could develop a thinking brain. We don't know how that happens, so I can't argue against it or for it. And the dinosaur person has featured throughout literature for quite some time, this lizard-like brain creature. And if you believe some of the documentaries, in the 65 million years between dinosaurs and mankind, dinosaurs could have had an entire civilization, developed nuclear fission, and sailed off into the stars, as purported by Star Trek. That was their approach to where did the dinosaurs all go. It is an interesting setting, but I personally do not think that it is a setting that can stand on its own. You need to incorporate other 
types of settings in order to give the dinosaurs more of a reason for being and for creating more plots. Dinosaurs don't commit political uh, intrigues. They don't try and buy up all the oil rights. Uh, no, it is the others that do that. So if you have to bring in the Atlanteans or aliens, that's entirely up to you. They will, of course, use the dinosaurs in various ways, and foolishly so. If you have modern-day technology, strapping lasers onto a dinosaur's head is actually a very silly approach to weaponizing a creature. There's a reason why we don't still use elephants in war. The actual flesh of the creature, contrary to popular belief, although it might be thick, a projectile or a laser beam will cut through it just as easily as if it was a human body. So if you have the capacity to introduce technology into the world of dinosaurs, they would simply become like our present-day animals, confined to enclosures for people to look at and wonder, not to be used as heavy lifting or machinery, because machinery can do it better, for longer, for faster, and for less stress and trouble. So that's something to think about. If you're going to go with a traditional wooden uh, Amazonian type of style where they've strapped great big howders onto the backs of Diplodocus as they head through the swamp lands and the dry territories and they fire crossbows and spears and things at one another, then it works. Look at our own history. That's exactly what we did. The biggest war machines we could get were war elephants or no one ever rode a rhino because, well, they just don't make good riding. So, Think about that kind of thing when you are looking at the dinosaur campaign. If we look at references, there are quite a lot of references from a feature film perspective. You've obviously got Jurassic Park, which is dinosaurs in the modern era. You've got The Lost World, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which was turned into a film in 1925 using fairly advanced stop-motion technology. And it's a very boring movie because there's no dialogue, but it's an interesting look at how this explorer, Professor Challenger, goes off to find dinosaurs that are lost in the deepest, darkest parts of Africa. You've got dinosaurs in Congo, for example. There was a delightful little Disney movie called Dinosaur, surprisingly enough. And, of course, there is that movie as well, the remake, where the dinosaurs all have personalities and can think and talk and have decided that rather than use their communicative brains to develop technology, they're going to still run around as dinosaurs. Book-wise, there is a book called Dinotopia, which looks at the idea of a civilization, very um, early civilization, Roman kind of uh, Atlantean space, where they are using dinosaurs for manual labor and that kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very beautifully illustrated book. Uh, the dinosaurs are all old school, though, where their tails still drag on the ground, as was surmised by scientists until they learned better. There are, of course, documentaries. Walking with Dinosaurs is a fantastic one if you want to get inspiration in terms of looking at the different types of dinosaurs. So there is a lot of material out there. Again, it's entirely up to you on how to use it. My advice, though, and I said it before, is to have this little bubble of dinosaurs that your regular game falls into and then can leave. Dinosaurs in a fantasy setting often don't have enough teeth, if you'll excuse the pun. What's terrifying about a nine meter long T-Rex in comparison to a dragon that can cast spells and breathe fire? There isn't really anything terrifying. So when I use dinosaurs in my role playing games, if they're fantasy based anyway, it's usually as some kind of jungle type predator, which is used for one sort of encounter and maybe as a potential threat moving forward, but never again. So you're looking at using these in a modern day setting or an apocalyptic setting or perhaps in a sci-fi setting. And of course, the sci-fi setting is the easiest one because it's a planet that has been untouched by the uh, evils of mankind. And perhaps there's an alien species that is trying to exploit the dinosaurs for whatever reason. Again, though, remember that technology barrier is big. I don't care what kind of flesh you have. If you're hit by some kind of phased polaron beam, you're going to explode. Dinosaurs are a fascinating space, and they prevent, prevent, they prevail in our imaginations because they are creatures that were real. They existed on this planet many, 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 many millions of years ago. And it allows us to tap into some really interesting fears that we as humans have. If they were still around whilst we were trying to evolve, 
Would we have evolved peacefully with them? No, probably not. We would have done the same that we did with the mammoths and destroyed their habitat and eaten them all. But they are a real creature. They truly existed. And we are discovering more of them as every month goes by and some paleontologist is out there knocking open the stones. The fact that I went wandering around on a site and found a little bone that was lost in stone for thousands or millions of years is testimony to the fact that there is this magic that still exists with dinosaurs. And if you can capture that in your game, if you can bring to life the amazing, unbelievable history and scale and presence and terror that these creatures represent to us as humans, then you will have a fantastic game. I hope this has been insightful somewhat in terms of how to run a dinosaur setting. And uh, if it was, hit that like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. And um, the topic was chosen on our new system, whereby you head over to our website, www.greatgamemaster.com. And uh, you can enter in topics that you would like me to discuss moving forward. And then if you are a Patreon member with us, you can then vote on which topics you feel should be discussed immediately, such as this one, for example, which has been on the cards for quite some time. And because of the first round of voting for the month of November, it has cho been chosen by the Patreons. And of course, I'm now rambling. So let me go and get eaten by a dinosaur. And all I can say to you, thank you for watching and happy gaming.